It's the end of an era, an era that some may argue ended some time ago, an era where ULA was actually a valid and relevant player in the world of commercial spaceflight. With the penultimate launch of the Delta IV Heavy just a few days ago, it would appear that things are very close to being over for ULA, at least for being a valid competitor for SpaceX, because Vulcan Centaur has suffered yet another setback. A setback that this time may be almost impossible to recover from. So is there any hope at all? We're gonna find out in just a moment. So as many of you know, I've been a big fan of the Vulcan Centaur and indeed ULA since I created this channel. Yeah, for a brief period of time, I thought that it was wrong that ULA was continuing to get contracts because they didn't have reusability built into their rockets. But the more I learned about Vulcan Centaur and the long-term plans with smart reusability on the engines, making a reusable space tug out of the Centaur upper stage, the more more supportive I became. But regardless of how much I might like ULA or Tori Bruno or Vulcan or anything like that, I would be remiss in my duties as a spaceflight journalist if I didn't call this what it is. A significant setback. A devastating setback, actually. The only way things could have gone worse is if ULA had tried to take off with Vulcan with Peregrine on board and blown the thing up. But this is nearly as bad because we're going to be looking at a launch maybe sometime early next year if everything goes well. And even that might be a little bit optimistic because given what has happened, it's going to take a long time for ULA to make this right and to finally get Vulcan off the ground, assuming it ever gets off the ground. So what's the big deal with Vulcan Centaur anyway? In the world of Starship, why does this rocket even matter? Well, because Vulcan Centaur can actually perform certain missions that no other rocket is going to be able to do. Let me say that again. Vulcan will be able to carry out certain missions that no other rocket currently in development is going to be able to do. How could this possibly be true? Well, first of all, unlike Starship, Vulcan is made out of extremely lightweight steel aluminum alloy. So thin and so lightweight, actually, that this is what created the current problem. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Because the automated manufacturing tech techniques and the small amount of material required in the construction has reduced the upfront cost so much that even in expendable mode, Vulcan Centaur is a very affordable rocket to launch. We're talking about a hundred million dollars or so, or very competitive with SpaceX Falcon Heavy, even in reusable mode. But it doesn't stop there. The U.S. military, one of ULA's primary customers obviously, has three different types of payloads, A, B, and C. A payloads can fit into just about any type of rocket, B payloads are designed for rockets with 5 meter fairings, C payloads are designed for rockets with 5 meter fairings, and extended fairings, fairings that SpaceX currently does not possess. As you can see, both the Atlas V 
and the Vulcan Centaur fairings are significantly longer than what SpaceX Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy currently uses. Although SpaceX has been supposedly working on an extended fairing for Falcon Heavy for many years now, Elon Musk doesn't really want to develop it. He's completely obsessed with Starship, which means Falcon Heavy cannot carry C-class payloads with the U.S. military. Currently, only Atlas V can do that and the Delta IV Heavy. However, the Delta IV Heavy is about to run out of rockets and Atlas V is in a similar situation. Now, of course, the obvious solution would be to put these big military payloads on a Starship, right? Well, that's not going to work either, because Starship is not well configured to carry heavy payloads all the way up to geosynchronous orbit without refueling. It simply isn't set up for that. It exhausts almost all of its fuel just getting up to low Earth orbit. Now, I've discussed this a number of times in previous episodes, but the long and the short of it is, Starship is so heavy, all of that stainless steel, such a massive rocket, it simply is not practical to try to get something that heavy, plus a heavy payload, all the way out to geosynchronous orbit. Starship's payload capability drops off by 85% just to get a payload to geosynchronous transfer orbit, or GTO. A geosynchronous delivery is even more difficult, and of course you're going to be losing an entire Starship in the process. You're not going to be able to re use the upper stage once it delivers a payload to that kind of altitude, making this solution pretty damned expensive as well as impractical. And another innovation that gives Vulcan a certain edge, with certain types of payloads anyway, is smart reusability. Now that Lofted has been tested and proven to be a very effective way of bringing payloads back to Earth without destroying them through the atmosphere, now smart reusability becomes a practical solution for reusability, so Vulcan will be able to expend all of the fuel in its booster, giving it a huge amount of performance without losing the engines. The BE-4s will ride this innovative inflatable heat shield all the way back to Earth and theoretically can then be reused. And that is just a couple of the innovations that give Vulcan a competitive advantage, at least again for certain types of payloads. By the way, this particular animation of Vulcan is courtesy of Sierra Space. Very nice of them to donate this, and the entire version of it is available on my Discord server if you want to check that out. In any event, what Vulcan is capable of doing while reusing its engines at the same time is carry over 27 metric tons up to low Earth orbit, up to 12.1 metric tons all the way out to translunar injection orbit, 15.3 3 tons to GTO, and finally 7 metric tons to geosynchronous orbit, one of the few rockets capable of delivering this kind of payload all the way out to a direct geosynchronous delivery. But the Centaur 5 advanced upper stage gives Vulcan Centaur even greater capabilities. In multi-manifest mode, this rocket in theory could carry up to 24 CubeSats, each weighing 80 kilograms each. On top of that, carrying a secondary payload with up to four to six modules, each weighing up to 318 kilograms, and then finally, the primary payload. As a matter of fact, the first launch of Vulcan Centaur is designed to do exactly this, dump off a couple of Kuiper test satellites in low Earth orbit, and then proceed all the way to the moon with the Peregrine. This is a capability that Centaur has never had in the past, and very few upper stages have currently. And finally, the Centaur 5 Advanced Upper Stage, previously known as ACES, will have the capability of acting as a space tug, carrying out a large number of secondary missions to and from the moon, and perhaps even landing on the moon as you saw in a previous animation. This is the sort of capability that ULA has been looking at for a very long time. A reusable, refuelable space tug, giving us better access to systems lunar space and allowing us to exploit a cis lunar economy, something that they were looking at doing a long time ago and were only stopped by politicians who wanted to protect SLS. 
Okay, you've been hearing me talk about a lot of theoretical capabilities, but all of that is theoretical after all, because this recent incident with the Centaur 5 test article in Alabama has thrown everything on its ear. It was hoped that what happened in Huntsville was not that serious, that minor modifications to the Centaur 5 that's currently at the Cape would be sufficient in order to get Peregrine off the ground. That is definitely no longer the case. The extremely hyper-thin steel that gave Vulcan its advantages in terms of payload and in terms of efficient and inexpensive manufacture have proven to be its Achilles heel. According to ULA, quote, Centaur's thin-walled pressure-stabilized tanks require minor reinforcement at the top of the forward dome prior to flight, unquote. In other words, this very thin metal was simply too thin to do the job. And this is a mistake that's difficult to understand. ULA has been working with the Centaur upper stage for years now. The delays with Blue Origin delivering the BE-4 engines have nothing to do with Centaur. Centaur is powered by one of the oldest and most reliable engines in the business, the RL-10 Aerojet Rocketdyne. There is no reason why ULA should not have detected these problems before Centaur was delivered to the Cape in the first place. They've had a test article to work on forever. They've had a tremendous amount of time to test the pressure on these tanks, to put them through their paces before they ever even delivered the rocket. Yes, mistakes happen to everyone. That is certainly something that needs to be acknowledged. I'm not a rocket scientist. I certainly couldn't do this stuff, but at the same time, this is a terrible moment for something this fundamental, this basic to be happening to this rocket after all the delays it has experienced already. So now, the customers who have been patiently waiting for Vulcan to finally fly are SOL. They're gonna have to wait a lot longer, and this is especially bad for Astrobotic and Peregrine. That lander has been in storage now for months, waiting to be shipped. And now it's most probably not going to be shipped until 2024. How long can Peregrine really stay in storage and still be viable? Is Astrobotic now going to lose this new race to the moon? That is to say, the first American spacecraft to set down on the lunar surface? It's very possible. And what about Dream Chaser? That's a vehicle that was also supposed to be riding up on a Vulcan Centaur. Is it going to be delayed until late next year? It certainly seems like that's going to be the case, and things just get worse from there. Obviously, the military is going to have their lives significantly complicated by this development, and also NASA is going to have no choice but to do business with SpaceX for all of their future interplanetary missions. Something that ULA did such a good job with, although Though they had a monopoly on the whole market, which made it extremely expensive as well. But now that SpaceX has that monopoly, they are charging substantially more than a typical Falcon 9 or a typical Falcon Heavy launch for these missions. I've seen the contracts, and they are a bit inflated. And one can't blame SpaceX for this, or Elon Musk. You're going to make as much money for your company as you can reasonably make, especially if you're the only game in town. You need to take advantage of those opportunities when they're presented to you. But what we really need is a competitive market, and that's something that neither the military nor NASA has at their disposal right now, and that is just bad for everybody. But there is a short-term solution, at least for some of these contracts, and that is ULA standby reliable rocket that has not had a single failure in 30 years. That's right, nearly a decade before SpaceX even came into existence. That was the last time Atlas V experienced an anomaly. Kind of difficult to imagine. So Atlas V can pick up the torch for at least some of these missions. And interestingly enough, a 
an Atlas V has already been assigned to the latest U.S. Space Force mission at the end of this year. Apparently, the whole congressional initiative regarding Russian engines doesn't seem to apply with Russian engines that were delivered to us prior to the law being enacted. At least, nobody seems to be trying to stop ULA from using Atlas V for military missions. Now, of course, Atlas V was already dedicated to a wide variety of missions before this problem happened. Atlas V is completely spoken for, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, not necessarily, because at least a half dozen of these Atlas V missions were dedicated to Boeing Starliner, a ship that may never fly, or if it does, it's certainly unlikely to fly as many times as we think it will. A half dozen Starliner flights seems ridiculously optimistic right now, and given that the last of these flights is scheduled to take place sometime in 2029, it's very realistic to expect that Vulcan Centaur will be human rated by 2029 and capable of carrying Starliner if that becomes necessary. Or even if it can't, Falcon 9 can carry Starliner up to orbit if need be. And wouldn't that be an irony? So here's the deal. ULA has found a way to survive, for now. Although in my opinion, they should start seriously thinking about reassigning Peregrine and the first flight of Dream Chaser to an Atlas V as well, in order to not seriously inconvenience those customers. And to make matters worse, the anomaly in Huntsville damaged the test stand significantly. Even if ULA gets a new test article ready, which by the way is going to be one of the Centaur 5 upper stages that they currently have in production, they don't have a place to test it. All of these things are going to be extremely complicated, to say nothing of the modifications that are going to have to be made in order to make Centaur 5 viable. ULA has a big hill to climb in the next 12 months, and things are going to be very uncertain, very unstable in the world of commercial spaceflight until that happens. Please smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support this content. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, stay angry about space!